again, everyone. Welcome to the Eddie Sutton Show. Eddie, you've coached this round ball sport a long, long time. Someday you're probably going to write a book about everything you've seen and done in this sport. I'm just not sure what you're going to call this chapter this season. Well, this has probably been one of the uh, two most frustrating years that I've ever coached, and I've coached nearly 40 years. Uh, this season started out with a lot of optimism, and I really thought we were going to be a, a very good basketball team. Uh, maybe I overestimated uh, how good I thought we would be, but I certainly thought we would be uh, in contention and be in the first division in the Big 12. And of course, uh, we lost a couple of games in December that we probably should have won. And uh, then once we got into conference play, we've just had a lot of misfortune in that uh, we had one young man leave our squad and we've had more injuries in this year than in any four or five years I, I've ever coached. So we're so thin right now, it's difficult when you play teams like the University of Texas and the University of Kansas, the two teams we played this last week. And uh, we're just uh, thin, especially on the front line, Tom, in that we don't have anybody to come off the bench. And when our big guys get tired or they get in foul trouble, all of a sudden uh, it's like an avalanche. Uh, a team like Kansas the other night, who I think is the best team in college basketball, they not only played well, they had a great shooting uh, night, shot 65%. I think they were 10 out of 15 from three-point range, and that's hard to overcome with, with a uh, thin squad. How tough has it been to keep morale up through all this frustration, or has it been tough at all? Well, we are blessed in that we have some wonderful young men, and uh, I, I think that uh, they'll play it out all the way to the end. And we certainly haven't thrown in the towel. Uh, we still have five ball games left. I think all five are certainly winnable games. We uh, play Texas A&M back to back. Mm -hmm. uh, then we play the University of Oklahoma on the road. Then we uh, go to Nebraska, and then we got Iowa State. So uh, all those teams are ball clubs. If we play uh, well, we can win, but we could also lose a lot of those games. Well, this freshman class has definitely shown improvement and great mouth-watering potential. No question about that. They've had their ups and downs like everyone else, and Eddie will grade the newcomers when we return after this opening timeout. We've seen that guy before, no question about that. Bob Simmons dropping by. A lot of people dropped by this show this year, and we appreciate them helping out. Welcome back to the show. And, Eddie, I guess the time has come. If it hasn't already arrived, we have to quit calling these freshmen freshmen because they're probably sophomores in playing time now. Well, let's take a look at Desmond Mason, one of the best athletes that uh, I've ever had in our, any of our basketball programs. I think he's still learning. Uh, he has ups and downs, but I think uh, he has the potential to be a very, very fine basketball player for Oklahoma State. Great jumping ability, uh, good defensive anticipation there on that steal. And uh, over the summer and the spring, before we start uh, practice next year, he needs to uh, get a little more consistent in his shooting. But he, is, uh, he has the ability to become a great defender, an outstanding rebounder, and I think uh, a very good scorer. Do you see the day coming in his future where he'd be the kind of guy, kind of like a Pierce, who can put the ball on the floor, take it right to the middle if he has to? I think uh, he is uh, the same type of player as Paul uh, Pierce at uh, the University of Kansas. And uh, as he matures, he can do that. He also is uh, an outstanding student. I think uh, he made a little over a three-point the first semester and a very talented artist. He uh, has a remarkable ability to be able to uh, paint pictures. Yeah, we enjoyed doing that feature early on this year on the uh, Eddie Sutton Show about his artistic talents and this is a guy like a lot of freshmen who really ride the emotional roller coaster, sometimes too high, sometimes too low, and that'll bottom out, that'll even out as the years go by. He's made it, uh, a lot of progress, but I agree with that. Uh, freshmen uh, many times don't realize there's a big jump between high school <laughs> and Big 12 conference play. and. I think they all go through growing pains. It's Joe Atkins uh, from John Marshall uh, High School. His team won the state championship last year. Uh, Joe, uh, I think, has been a little frustrated, and he's always been an off guard, played a two guard position, and we've tried to uh, groom him uh, because we have lacked a true point guard in our program. And uh, that takes a lot of uh, really experience and practice and I think at times as I said I think he's been a little frustrated because it is new to him and uh, he like Desmond uh, are the two that uh, will finish out the season with us uh, hopefully without uh, any either one of them going down 
by injury like some of their other uh, Frost uh, classmates have done. Uh, very good shooter, good quickness. I think the one thing in the offseason that we'll emphasize to, uh, to Joe is uh, let's get in that weight room and get a little stronger because I, that is one area when you go from high school basketball to college basketball, it's just a tougher, more physical game. Sure wish we had this fellow back. Yeah, it, we would have won some of the games we've lost here in the last couple of weeks that had uh, Alex Weber not gone down with a, a back injury because probably of all the freshmen of the three, he probably uh, was the biggest surprise and probably graded out the highest marks uh, as far as uh, being able to contribute uh, in a positive manner. Had some real quality minutes, had some good ball games for us. I like Alex because he's a tough, hard-nosed uh, player who uh, has the desire to uh, be a good college basketball player. His father was a great player for Arkansas State. And uh, I might add that uh, he went through surgery this last uh, Monday and the uh, surgeon removed a, a chip uh, that was pressing against his uh, uh, a nerve which was causing all the pain and the uh, doctor said that had they not had surgery well he wouldn't have gotten any better. Uh, he'll be back uh, working with a physical therapist in about two weeks and in three months they said that he could be back on the basketball court uh, running up and down the court and, and working out so I really believe that Alex will be an outstanding basketball player here at Oklahoma State before uh, he leaves. And no one wants to get back on the court quicker than he does, and he can't rush a situation like that. Here's a fella you know wants to get back on the court. Well, Estelle Astor, uh, had he not uh, broke a bone in his hand, would have uh, been playing a lot right now because I think he uh, possesses a great competitive spirit. He's probably the quickest player uh, that we have, and because of his quickness, he has the ability to be a, a, a great defender on the, on the perimeter. And you can see right there, uh, he's turning a, the man with a basketball. A very quick jump shooter. He's got uh, good spring, uh, outstanding athlete. Uh, he'll challenge for a starting position next year. I really think that uh, he is one of those guys that I call a gym rat. He, he wants to play, and you can see the, the effort right there when he went after that loose ball. Not a good sight there. <laughs> no. He uh, became very frustrated during that period of time when he had that cast on. and He's been back working out with us now for a week or 10 days, and uh, he certainly helped us in our practice session. Scott Robich, uh, younger brother Brett Robich, who starts at center for us. Scott uh, is from Springfield, uh, Illinois. His dad, uh, the other night at Kansas, was recognized uh, uh, by the Kansas mm -hmm. fans. He's one of the great players ever played for the Jayhawks. He's fourth in uh, all-time scoring and rebounding, and that's remarkable record in that he only played three years. And uh, Scott uh, will probably uh, get a medical red shirt year or he will get one just like Estelle Laster. So they'll come back and they'll be uh, second year players as far as uh, being in college, but they'll only have freshman uh, eligibility. So we'll have him for four years just like Estelle. But Scott, uh, I think, will be a, a player that probably, unlike his brother, will play more facing the basket. I don't think uh, Scott's a true center. I think he's more of a swing type player, excellent perimeter shooter. These young men came in with so many expectations placed upon them by people who really don't know the game of basketball. I'm not including the coaches in that area because you're more realistic in what it takes to adapt to the college game. But keeping that in mind, have they progressed, injuries notwithstanding, have they progressed along the route that you thought they would? Well, I think that uh, they've improved. I, I, I'm not sure that uh, it's hard to, to evaluate when they've been injured, mm -hmm. but uh, I still am very optimistic that uh, all five of those guys are going to be very good players for us in years to come. I uh, just wish that we could have kept them all yep. healthy this year because I think we'd have a much better record uh, had we been able to do that. Well, there's no question we all have to deal with a lot of stress on our jobs. But what about basketball coaches? Well, they have their own way of reducing that stress level, and we're going to show you when we return to the Eddie Sutton Show. You know, I can tell you, it's not funny firsthand. It's not funny when it's happening at the time. But basketball coaches really have their own way of reacting to stressful situations. Take a look.
I tell you what, a lot of our fans have been stressed out this year too, but I think I've got a few more wrinkles after this year. But you know, the one thing, uh, I've had so many great thrills uh, in basketball and uh, the good times certainly have outweighed the few uh, bad times we've had. But, uh, and I guess that's what I told our squad and I told our coaches the other day, I said, you know, when we come back uh, in a year or two and uh, we have a great ball club, then you'll appreciate the good times uh, after going through a season like we've been through this year. We joke about it all the time. We didn't get it on camera. Uh, but the guy who looks like he's played the game and those close ones is Sean. I mean, Sean sometimes after a game looks like he got caught out in a rainstorm somewhere. You know, uh, I think if some coaches, you know, television allows us to see so many games, but there have been some coaches that they start out and they look like something out of, Miss, you know, the best dressed magazine for men in the, in the country. And by the time the game is halfway through, their ties off, their coats off. And we're playing one of those guys Saturday. Tony Broning's a heck of oh, a yeah. coach for Texas yeah. A&M. And he'll come out and he'll look so dapper. And he gets in that game and pretty soon it, it all comes a coat in the necktie. And, but that basketball will do that to you. Yeah, uh, and I'm glad we never had have cameras back when you could have taken pictures of me. Okay, the notebook and a very important trip to College Station. They're both next when we return to the 80-something show. Look at that. Reach out and touch that ball right there. Wilson would like to see that. I mean, you know, they I'm supply sure they us did. with all the, all the basketball. I'm sure they did. There's probably something behind that right there. We won't add. We'll try to report to you next week on that. Welcome back to the show. Let's get right to this week's notebook. We call this first item 8 and 8 and 17. Magic numbers. Let me quote from the Big 12 release this week. <coughs> In the 12 years of the larger field, let's talk about 64 team uh, field. Since 1984-85, every Big 12 team back, I guess, in the respective conferences competed in the regular season at 500 in the league play with at least 17 Division I wins. That seems to be the magic mark for this year's NCAA tournament. I think it's amazing, Stick. I'm not sure that uh, if there was a conference where there was a, a, it was a super league and somebody came up with a 7-9 record mm -hmm. that, uh, and they had some impressive non-conference victories that the NCAA selection committee wouldn't choose a ball club like that. But I think through the years, that has been the measuring stick that you had to win at least half your conference games and then uh, win 17 ball games. So uh, I think we got a ways to go. As we apply it to Oklahoma State, and certainly we're just looking at winning one half at a time the rest of the way, but just looking at the big picture, the number eight is the first, the most important number in that equation right there. The others will take care of themselves, but getting to 500 is the, is the main deal, is it not? No, we're four and seven, so that means that uh, we'd have to win four out of our next five ball games. And I said earlier, all the teams that we have left uh, are winnable ball games, but they're also games that uh, you could lose uh, one or you could lose them all because uh, the balance uh, of the teams that we're playing were pretty even. Well, this past week, a recent survey came out. We call it What's Happened? A survey saying basically that there's not a real high degree of shooting accuracy across the board in the NCAA in the last year or so. Could the preoccupation with a dunk and three-point have something to do with that? Well, I think that has a lot to do with it. I think uh, shooting is an art, and I think in order to be a good shooter, one has to really discipline themselves and manage their time and go out and, and work on their shooting. And I think today, too often, you see uh, basketball players in the offseason in particular, they will go out and uh, they'll play five on five or four on four mm -hmm. or three on three. And, and they really don't allow enough time for them to really go out and improve their shooting. Uh, and there's such an emphasis put on the dunk mm -hmm. and the three-point shot. And I think that has really led to uh, uh, maybe, I don't want to say poor shooting, but there's great shooters today. Some of the best shooters that ever played the, the round ball sport we have. But if you take numbers, if you were to take 100,000 basketball players today versus 100,000 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and go out and line up and play some ga a game of horse, I'm not sure that the present day players, when you take numbers, wouldn't be beaten just because of what I said. I think there's a lack of dedication on their part to go out and really work on their game. You've said this to your kids so many, time over the, so many times over the years, and I look at Randy Rutherford as being a prime example you have to spend so much time on your own perfecting that shot. And I don't know that you see that kind of dedication that you saw in Rutherford when he was here across the board. Well, when you find someone like Randy Rutherford, and that's why I say there are players today that are the greatest shooters that we've ever seen. 
but you would also, if you trace their background, they've spent hours and hours and hours in that at gymnasium or arena. And uh, that's the thing we're always telling all of our players. If you guys want to be a good shooter, you've got to go out and work on your game. And uh, what happens today with a lot of young people, uh, they have the desire to want to be good, but they don't have the follow through or the dedication to make it happen. We're on the road now, recruiting. Spring signing date is coming up. Recruiting is an ongoing process. It's always going on in terms of fall, winter, spring type situation, but it seems to get a lot of focus at this time of the year. Well, we've only signed one player in the early signing period, Mike Johnson, and he was at our game the other night mm -hmm. in Kansas, and is really having a banner season. He had 30 points Friday night uh, uh, in his game, and I think that he's going to be a welcome addition. But we've got to go out and sign three or four more players this spring in order to uh, elevate our talent uh, pool to a level where we're going to be competitive next year in the Big 12. And that's what I told uh, Paul Graham and Sean Sutton, uh, my two assistants. I said, you guys got to get out on that road, beat the bushes, and uh, find uh, some guys that uh, can come in and help us immediately. We, we're happy with the players we have in our program. We talked about all of our freshmen, but we need some additional help. And, of course, you've alluded to it on previous shows, somebody in the point guard area with some experience and a couple of big fellas that take up some space in the middle. Yeah, I'd like to get a couple of those big old grizzly bears, those <laughs> brown bears that chased me up in Alaska when I was salmon fishing a couple years ago. Somebody built like them. No, we need a couple of, of uh, big people that can come in and, uh, and uh, have the experience that uh, can really step up, play good defense, rebound, and uh, give us a boost. So uh, recruiting is important, and it's an endless process. From the time you sign one class, you're into the next group. All right, quickly, Texas A&M and College Station Saturday afternoon. Dangerous team despite their record. Well, they are dangerous. They've played everybody tough recently. Uh, I think they've only won two conference games. They beat the University of Missouri and uh, beat Kansas State. But uh, they've played everybody tough. And believe me, the way we're playing, uh, it will be a war down there. I've been to G. Raleigh White, and uh, their mascot, Reveille, will be waiting on us down there, barking. <laughs> uh, great fans. Boy, it's a great, a great setting. And uh, Tony Baroni is an outstanding coach. So it's a, I think it's a, a very, very important game for both ball clubs. Well, Oklahoma State returns home on Wednesday night to play these same Aggies back-to-back -back games with Texas A&M. And very, very important. We'll see you in Gallagher Ivan Arena. We'll see you right here next week. For Eddie Sutton, I'm Tom Dorado. Goodbye, everybody.